praise the Lord. Well, we are in week two of Unwrapped, Discovering Your Spiritual Gifts. Last week, uh, we did an introduction of all of that. If you were not here last week, I highly recommend, highly recommend that you go back and listen. It was an in-depth introduction to this. So I'm going to do a brief kind of recap so that you're not lost with that. But please go back and watch that. And, and, and let me just remind you, if you the whole point of, of filling the little card out, we're, we're updating our system. So be sure, if you have not done that, to, to fill that out for us. The other sheet that you got is for our sermon today to help you engage and to learn. So we'll get to that in a minute. Please do not fill that out. I know it's a temptation. Do not fill that out until we get there and we go one at a time because I teach as we go along. And so you may not answer the same way. So just hold up on that. Let me give you some review to make sure we're all on the same page. Last week, I pulled out a basket of fruit. I had uh, apples and oranges and bananas. All three of those things are fruit, but they're not the same. So there's, there's the potential for confusion when we talk about the spiritual gifts, because in the New Testament, there's a bunch of places that talk about the spiritual gifts, but in reality, we only have the one English word, gift. It's used in all of those scriptures, but in the original writing, in the original Greek language, there's three different words used. So there are actually three different categories of spiritual gifts. So that's very important. So quickly, I'm going to hit, hit those, uh, and then we'll move on with the first one. The, the first category is motivational motivational gifts if this is if you're getting this for the first time I gave you a place for notes on the back of that if you want to write these down motivational gifts number two manifestation gifts it's a different category different thing and then finally the ministry and I like the word positional gifts that's the third category now for the next few weeks we're gonna focus on the motivational gifts that Peter describes in 1 Peter 4:10. The big difference between the motivational gifts and the other two categories, you got to get this. You have to hear me. We are born with these gifts. We possess these gifts before we are saved, before we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We possess these gifts. It's our spiritual DNA. Every single human on the planet has been given a gift. Case in point, we've all sat under amazing teachers or speakers or watched gifted artisans or craftsmen or artists, singers, whatever, and we knew that they were not Christians, but they were gifted. That's what I'm talking about, okay? We have these when we are born. That's the big difference. And so Peter describes what these gifts are about in 1 Peter 4.10 using the Greek word charisma. Okay, and so he says this. Let's look at 1 Peter 4.10. God has given each of you, everybody say that, each of you, everyone, each of you, a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. And then he says, use them well. How? To serve. To serve one another. In their purest form. And that means when we have taken that gift and dedicated it back to God, in its purest form, our motivational gift will always benefit others and not just ourself. Not just ourself. So then, then Paul uses the same Greek word in Romans chapter 12, and he lists these. So now we're comparing apples to apples. It's the same word. So he lists these motivational gifts in Romans 12, 6 through 8. Let's look at that. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Hello, look at me. You don't have to be good at everything. Right. Let me just fill you in. You're not good at everything. And that's okay. That's okay. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, and we're going to use the word perceive because that's a closer rendering of the Greek. Perceive, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If your gift is uh, teaching, teach well. If your gift is to encourage, and we're going to use the word exhort when we get there, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability or administrative ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness, and we're going to use the word compassion to others, do it gladly. Last week, I'll, I did a brief 
introduction of all seven of those gifts, we're going to dive into just one, the first one, perceiver. Perceiver. That's what we're going to talk about today. If you'll get that sheet of paper out, on that sheet of paper, it's got the, the ten characteristics or statements of the perceiver. Again, does anybody need one? Raise your hand if you did not get one. Right here. Edwin, just in the middle. Anybody else? Does anybody need a new one? <laughs> you, you've already filled it out. <laughs> I need you to throw that one away. Does anybody need another one? For whatever reason, we won't say that you filled it out ahead of time. Just, you need another one. There's grace in the house. Anybody else? Thank you guys for doing that. Awesome. So we're going to be talking about just the perceiver today. And we use the word perceive instead of prophesy, like I said, because it's a closer rendering of the Greek. Basically, it's the gift of perception. Okay, but the actual definition that I want you to use is this. It's on the screen. The Christian perceiver. Now, that's that what we be careful because we're talking about the Christian perceiver not someone who's in the world. The Christian perceiver who is, is one who is readily perceives, prays about, that's a key, and then proclaims the will of God. The Christian perceiver is one who readily perceives, prays about, and proclaims the will of God. And that's Don Fortune. Uh, Don and Katie Fortune wrote a book called Discovering Your God-Given Gifts. You might want to write that somewhere. You can order that book on Amazon, have it in two days, and it will take you even deeper than what I'm going to be doing in this study. I use some of my own studies and then some of theirs as well. But I promise you, you'll love that book if you want to dive into that as well. Now, for the next few minutes, we're going to go through this uh, sheet. We're going to uh, fill this out. And here's, here's the deal with this. Don't go ahead. Don't skip ahead. Go one at a time. Don't answer until I tell you to. And answer not as you think you should be, not as you want to be, but as you are, <laughs> and not even as you have learned to be. I want you to answer your knee-jerk reaction, your natural, if there was no filter. This is, should be fun for you. If there was no filter whatsoever, I want you to answer that way. So don't be afraid to put a five. If it hits you between the eyes, put a five. If it absolutely, like, that's not me at all, please put a zero. If you just put twos and threes and fours down, all the gifts are going to be the same. You're not going to be able to differentiate when we get to the end. It's going to be confusing. So don't be afraid to go to the extremes if that's the way it is, okay? Let's start. Number one, we're talking about the Christian perceiver now. I see things as either black or white. There is no gray area. No gray area. Here's the deal. Every perceiver, if it's their top gift, Christian or not, really, honestly, see things as black or white, right or wrong. The Christian perceiver views people or situation as either in the will of God or out of the will of God. And so if somebody's not perfectly in the will of God, they are still out of the will of God. It's black and white. Perceivers see uh, life as a matter of choices. To choose right is imperative. They are champions for righteousness, okay? And there's no compromise, no compromise. Now, a biblical figure that you can write in there to study a little bit more about is John the Baptist. His whole ministry was about exposing evil and preaching again. He had one message. Anybody want to take a stab at his one message? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, be baptized, turn from your sin. He was bold, he was outspoken. He, he even spoke against Herod, who was the ruler in that area. He called him out on an adulterous affair with his brother's wife. And he wouldn't be quiet about it. He was warned. He wouldn't be quiet about it. He kept speaking about it. They finally threw him into prison, and eventually it cost him his life. John the Baptist. He also called the religious leaders out. 
They came down there, the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the teachers of the law, they came down to just check him out, and, and he, didn't, he didn't allow, he, he called them he called a brood of vipers. That's a perceiver. Brood of vipers. And he even called the people out who came down just to get baptized because everybody else was. He's, he's like, look, you're just getting wet. This means nothing unless you are willing to live like your baptism. If you're, unless your life is going to change, you may as well not even go through the motions of this. Perceivers, listen, are not worried about being politically correct. <laughs> they're bold, they're outspoken. Their main concern is righteousness, not what people think. Not what people think. Go ahead and mark your answer. If you haven't already. I see things as black or white. Number two, I easily read the character of individuals and groups. It's easy for perceivers to just walk into the room and get a feel for how things are spiritually. And it can be a little scary sometimes. You may have had this experience. Perceivers have an ability to kind of see the hidden things, to kind of know things that you've not even told them about. Has anybody had that experience where you, there's a Christian uh, friend that you trust and they just read your mail? I mean, just read, your, and you're like, or maybe God used you that way. Mark your answer. I easily read the character of individuals and groups. You just, you just have an ability, you go in even to a service or some kind of thing, and you just kind of get a sense for the real spirituality of the place, of what's really happening. Number three, I have very few close friendships. Very few close, that's close is the, is the key word there. Uh, the perceiver is not going to have 10 BFFs. They have no, they have no ability. There's no, there's no way. They would explode. There, there's no way a perceiver could have a bunch of best friends. They're not ulti, uh, real social sometimes. Have you ever heard this? That guy's kind of a loner. Or she's kind of a, maybe somebody said that about you. Somebody said that about me many times. You've, I've, said it, I've said it from the pulpit. I'm, I, have a, I have to fight that introverted personality. God, in his great cosmic uh, humor, made me a pastor. Pastors deal with people. Isn't that funny? God's so, so funny. So I have to be very intentional there. When you, hey, listen. Parents, kids that are perceivers, that are high perceiver gifts, often will only have one or two best friends their whole growing up years. And it can be unnerving sometimes, and you're like, why aren't they more social? Well, this is good information. God has wired them that way. God has wired them that way. My mom, I think, had several conversations with me growing up that I should be, and, I, and, and she's right. She was trying to help me to be intentional about relationships. And so... Just keep that in mind. I have very few close friendships. Perceivers generally have highly selective friendships. Highly selective friendships. They, don't just, they just don't have the tolerance level necessary to have a bunch of friends. Okay, answer that question. I have very few close friendships. Number four. I am frank, outspoken, and I don't mince Words. <laughs> quit, quit elbowing your spouse. Perceivers have an opinion about everything. And if you're talking with a perceiver and they haven't thought about it or made an opinion, they will make one on the spot. They will come up with one on the spot. You just thought of somebody, didn't you? Maybe it's you. This listen, listen, this is important. This characteristic often gets the perceiver in trouble. Here's why. An immature perceiver can come across as rude, crass, negative, critical, and just a drag to be around. In other words, if you were on Survivor, you'd get voted off first. Let me, everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. That is not God's will for the perceiver. 
That is a polluted version of the gift. That is when the gift has not been completely dedicated back to God. That's when the enemy gets a foothold and uses it against us instead of for us. That's not God's will. The mature perceiver, listen, you can count on them. You can count on them to be honest, upfront, and candid. But listen, it, the mature perceiver who's dedicated that gift to God will be guided by wisdom and prayer. That's so important. Go ahead and mark your answer for that one. I'm frank, outspoken, and don't mince words. Be honest. Be honest. Number five, I grieve deeply. I grieve deeply over the sins of others. I grieve, remember this is the Christian perceiver. I grieve deeply over, a perceiver will literally weep. Weep when they see someone caught up in sin. Why? Because they know it will destroy their life and their family. Could be adultery, pornography, whatever it is, they will literally weep. It's like, like the weeping prophet Jeremiah. It's that whole feel. And here, here's, here's the deal. That's why, we're going to talk about this in a second. That's why the perceiver is called to intercessory prayer. They pray for the Holy Spirit to convict of sin. And if led by the Holy Spirit, that's a key, if led by the Holy Spirit, they are not afraid to confront sin, just like Nathan with King David. By the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Mark your answer. I grieve deeply over the sins of others. Number six. I strongly desire the spiritual growth of groups and individuals. I strongly desire the spiritual growth of groups and individuals. Christian perceivers want to see results. They want to see growth. They want to see progress and not excuses. Now this one hit me between the eyes. I'm, perceiver is not my top gift. It's number three for me, but it's way up there. I definitely operate in, 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 with a little bit of an edge sometimes, in prophetic edge. But this particular answer is a five for me. This particular answer, wanting to see people grow spiritually, is why I had to become a senior pastor. It's why I had to shift from where I was as a worship pastor to God instilling and pouring into me the desire to see people connect to their purpose, quit living these lives that don't mean anything, but to connect to their gifting and their purpose and live out a joyful, fulfilled Christian life. I had to become a pastor for that reason. It drives everything that I do. Everything. You can see I'm passionate about that. That's what these gifts will do. It pulls out what those things that are your passions and those things that are not. And guess what? If you're not, it's okay. We want to condemn, if, if we're passionate about something, we think everybody ought to be passionate about that thing. But that's not the way the body of Christ works. That's not what he instructs us. That's why I'm doing this series, because it brings freedom when we know we don't have to be rust. We don't have to be good at everything. We don't have to be passionate about everything, because if we were, we wouldn't be good at anything. The body of Christ has been brought together with all of the different gifts for a purpose so that everything is covered. Don't look down your nose at somebody that doesn't or is not passionate about the same thing as you are. We're wired differently. We're gifted differently for a reason. I strongly desire the spiritual growth of groups. Mark your answer. Number seven, and this is probably the, not probably, it is the biggest one out of the ten. I feel called to intercessory prayer. And let me just clarify, that's not praying for your grocery list. That's not praying for a new car, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not praying for a new house or a better job or more money or, or even your, 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 your sickness or whatever. It's not praying about yourself, but it's standing in the gap for somebody else. That's intercessory prayer. 
mature perceivers, listen to this, have an innate sense that this intercessory prayer is the most important aspect of their life and ministry and calling. The most important aspect. A high perceiver, a high perceiver, somebody who's the, that's their top gift, is definitely called to intercessory prayer. We'll talk about that in a second. Listen, it, at the end of your, at the study, because here's what we're going to do with these. You've got to keep this list when you're done. You've got to put it in your Bible because we're going to do seven of these. So this, you remember what I said last week? Don't miss your moment. This, you may be sitting there going, none of these, none of them. This is not your moment. But it's important for you to know it because you may be married to that moment. <laughs> your child may be that moment. Your coworker may be that moment, or even worse, your boss may be a perceiver. Woo! Sorry, staff. I mean, I'm, I'm so sorry. They're like, dear God. Do you see the importance of it? You've got to keep this and then compare it. But if at the end you discover that perceiver is your top gift, you are called to intercessory prayer. You are called. Look at the screen. Perceivers should be slow to speak and quick to pray. You better write that down. Perceivers should be slow to speak and quick to pray. Now, I added my own version of this. Perceivers should be slow to post on Facebook and quick to pray first. I am. I am. I'm praying. I'm serious. Here's, here's the deal. Perceivers see things and feel things that the rest of us don't. They're real. They see the wrong that needs to be righted. They see the, the injustice that needs to be taken care of. They see the sin that needs to be confronted. And then they get on Facebook and go, blah. <laughs> blah. It's, a, it, it, it's literally, that's what happens. Or you actually do that to somebody's face and rip them up. Perceivers must be quick to pray and slow to speak. Before you post, and this is good for any of us, pray about, if there's, if there's just a possibility about what you're about to put out there in the world, social media, is, is going to be controversial or hurtful, And I promise you, you'll probably not do it. Or you'll change it. Because you'll end up making a point and not a difference. Yeah, you'll make your point And you'll get all kinds of likes or comments or whatever. You get people going, I've seen it all week. Anybody else? Come on. Right now it's happening across our nation. And the Christians are not excluded. I see my close friends making idiots of themselves on Facebook, trying to make a point. And what happens is you alienate yourself from the other side and you'll never be able to minister to them. I refuse, folks. I've got perceiver in me. Believe me, I want to post. Oh, do I want to post? Do I want to comment? But I don't, because when the dust settles, I want to be able to speak into their life if the Holy Spirit gives me the opportunity. Yeah. Got about 20% of you to agree with me on that. That's right. That's all right. I'm going to do it anyway. I feel, feel called to intercessory prayer. Why don't you go ahead and answer that one? Let me give you another point under that one while you're writing. Look at the screen. God's purpose in giving perceivers insight is that they can intercede effectively. The purpose of God pouring into an inter, uh, a perceiver that, that hidden message, that hidden stuff, is not so that they can go gossip. It's not so that they can go post about it on Facebook. It's not so that they can rip somebody up with it or judge somebody with it. It's so that they can pray about that person effectively. That's it. That's it. All right, number eight. 
I feel the need to verbalize or dramatize what I see. Those things in the spirit that you see, you feel the need to verbalize it or drama, even dramatize it. Or maybe I'm going to add, write it down. Maybe, maybe write a story about it. There's someone in our church that I love who, who does that. He writes stories from his experiences and what God speaks to him. And then he, if, if God, if the Holy Spirit allows, he shares those with the person. And it's powerful. The, the biblical example for that is Hosea. Hosea married Gomer, who was a prostitute. <laughs> if that ain't dramatic, I don't know what is. He was trying to illustrate the relationship with God the Father and Israel. And see, when Gomer went back to her life of prostitution, y'all need to hear this. When, 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 God, when uh, Gomer went back to her life of prostitution, Hosea went after her to illustrate how God chased down Israel and kept forgiving and kept going back even though they prostituted themselves by worshiping idols. That's dramatic. That's intense. That's extreme. And that's the perceiver. That's the perceiver. Some perceivers will use the stage, dr drama, actual drama. They're drawn to that field because they themselves kind of live in a world that's dramatic. John the Baptist, again, he was a very dramatic person. He, he, he dressed weird. He, he, you know, camel and, and, you know, he ate locusts and wild honey and all those things. Dramatic. Go ahead and mark your answer. Number nine, I desire to be obedient to God at all costs. Before you answer, read those last three words again. At all costs costs. That means the perceiver, if they're walking with God, they're willing to leave their home, their job, their comfort, their family, to go on the mission field, to leave, go to another part of the country. They are willing to live in extreme situations at all costs. Mature perceivers recognize the importance of obedience. Now, parents, listen to me. Child perceivers are strong-willed kids. And now, just because you have a strong-willed child does not mean necessarily that they are a perceiver. But if you have a perceiver child, they will be strong-willed. They will be stubborn. They will be harder to deal with. But if you don't instill with them and stick with them the importance of obedience, it's going to get ugly. And that gift in them is going to be polluted. So you have to stay firm. Tough love, you've got to do it no matter what. You've got to do it. You've got to stick with it for that perceiver child. I desire to be obedient to God at all costs. Go ahead and mark your answer there. Number 10, I'm eager to discover my blind spots and to help others see theirs too. Everybody knows what a blind spot is, right? We get out on the road and you're getting off 575, getting onto the highway, and you look in that side view mirror and there's nothing there and you put your blinker on and go, and all of a sudden you hear, and you look over and there's a car right there. Well, it's because they were in your Blind spot, and you didn't take the time to look over your shoulder and see that there was a car, in fact, there. Well, we all have behaviors and things that we do that are blind spots that drive people crazy. <laughs> and usually, we, most of us don't want to know what those are. Just leave us alone. Well, perceivers, they want to know. They want to know what their blind spots are, and they're real quick to point out yours as well. All right? So I'm eager to discover my blind spots and to help others see theirs too. Mark your answer. When you get done, I want you to add those up and put your final number at the bottom. Make sure you're accurate with that. And again, make sure you keep these. Put them in your Bible. Put them somewhere where you're not going to lose them because this is going to be compared to the other gifts at the end. Now, I'm closing with some important information, okay? 
If you want to, you can turn over the sheet and use the back, the notes section. Now, these are four problem areas for perceivers. Problem areas for perceivers. Number one, tends to be judgmental and blunt. Tends to be judgmental and blunt. Perceivers can easily get a severe case of foot-in-the-mouth disease. Foot-in-the-mouth disease. Jonah is a biblical example. He was racist. He, he, he was operating a polluted version of this gift. He prejudged the Ninevites. He didn't want to go. We just did a series about Jonah. He was operating in that polluted version. If you're a perceiver, you will find that God will deal firmly in your life if you don't learn to pray more and criticize less. God, listen to me, everybody look at me. God will deal firmly with you if you're a perceiver and you don't learn this. You'll go around the mountain again and again and again until you get this. Number two, oh, let, me, let me, sorry, go back. Here's a point under this. Prayer is the safeguard against criticism. Come on. Prayer is the safeguard. Prayer is the safeguard against criticism. That's good for all of us, by the way. Before you judge, before you criticize, pray. Number two, forgets to praise partial progress. Forgets to praise partial progress. Now, guys, this hit me in the right between the eyes. I'm a task-oriented person. I see the finish line. Anybody else like that? Come on, be honest. We see the finish line. We don't really care how we get there. We don't really care about the journey. We just care about where we finish. Well, that's not good because a lot of other people are all about the journey and they need to be encouraged and they need to be thanked. They need to be appreciated. And if you're a perceiver, you forget all about this. And so you have to really be intentional to praise partial progress. Number three, intolerant of differing uh, opinions. <laughs> intolerant of differing opinions. You are right, you are right, you are right. And you're not willing to look at a subject at any other angle but your own. The problem is truth sometimes has other angles and perspectives. And the perceiver has a hard time with that. So be careful. And number four, this is important, struggles with self-image. Struggles with self-image. Why, Pastor Allen? Because a perceiver longs for righteousness. And the Bible says no one's righteous. No, not one. Apart from the blood of the Lamb. And so a lot of times a perceiver will get very legalistic and feel like they have to do everything right and nobody can do that. And so therefore a perceiver has that tendency to, to be hard on themselves and feel like that they are inadequate they end up with a low self-esteem. This is That's important. Let me give you the big idea for the day. Big idea for the day. Out of all seven gifts, everybody hear it? The perceiver has the most potential for extremes. So a growing relationship with Christ is absolutely vital. The perceiver has the most potential for the extremes. They can be the greatest thing in the kingdom of God ever. But they can also be so destructive and hateful and miserable. That's the extremes. And so a growing relationship with Christ, a praying relationship, a daily, come on, a daily walk with Christ is absolutely vital for the perceiver to operate in a pure gift that will help the body of Christ and not destroy it. Would you bow for